morning, everyone. Uh, we're so glad you're here uh, to worship. We are ready to begin. We're going to sing the great I am. We know that uh, right. when Moses said to God in the burning bush, who should I say sent me? And he said, just tell him I am. And he told him more than that. And you're going to learn about that this morning. But this song is just called Great I Am. We're going to worship him. And if you're online, we welcome you as well. If you're able to, let's stand and sing it together. to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real, and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one. seated. Welcome everyone. So very pleased to have you today to gather in together for the purpose of worshiping God. So thankful that you're here and that we have this opportunity. Well, listen, I want to let you know a few things. This is our transition from our summer schedule to the fall schedule. So this Wednesday night, we start our fall programming for all ages. Many of the groups start at 6 and other groups start at 630 um, please check our poster stations at both entrances to get details about any group that you might be interested in, or just catch me and I'll help you uh, figure it out as well. Well, then this next Saturday, we're having a call to prayer. It's, it's, it's here in the sanctuary. It's from 9 to noon. It's really a come and go sit and pray, kneel and pray, stand and pray, walk the church building and prayer walk over the spaces and, and the people that meet in those spaces and the people that teach in those spaces and the lives that are changed in this place. It's a call to prayer. And you're invited, if you can't be here with us, and just remember to pray between 9 and 12, especially for back to school and the direction of our church and the calling of a pastor and God is his work and plans for us in this in this season and through the fall remember to pray one of the things that we've been doing this summer is just sharing how God is at work in this place and he is 
Boy, I have a lot of stories to share with you. If you haven't heard me already share them, I'd be happy to tell you about the new members and the baptisms and the vacation Bible school and the mission trips and the youth trips and so on, so much that God is doing. And to that end, I've invited people to let me know if they would share a testimony as God leads, as God prompts. And so today, Lisa Allen is coming to share a testimony, a message from God. Good morning. So I was so broken, my heart was so hard. In fact, so much that my coworker was afraid to invite me to uh, crusade Jesus for uh, crusade for Jesus. And um, but the Lord had laid her on my heart so heavy that she did invite me. She's afraid to ask me to church because I look so mean. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, uh, I didn't have anything better to do, so I went ahead and went to the, um, the service. And, um, you know, the message was, just hit me so strong about the reality of God and Satan and the battle, the, the warfare and what goes on. Um, at that time, my mom was a leader in witchcraft. And, um, and, um, so it made more sense to me. And before you knew it, uh, I had gone forward and um, they took me into this uh, room on the side. And um, the lady that was with me, she's asking all kinds of questions that I didn't have answers for. Uh, in my home, we never had a Bible and I didn't know what to say. She didn't know how to handle it. She'd never experienced this. So she went and got the pastor's wife and um, the pastor's wife came and, and um, explained about sin and how we need the Savior and, and, um, ex and then taught me how to pray. And at that moment, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that was in 1987. I was 21 years old. And um, uh, my, uh, my, my life had been changed. And then as a new believer, I, I claimed an ax. Uh, I had the whole church praying, um, and, I, and the, the verse that says, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved, you and your household. And I knew that if I felt, I believe in my heart, if my mom got saved, the rest of the, the, our household would follow, because she's such the leader that she was. And so we had the whole church praying, um, and I kept praying, and uh, and then um, uh, my mom and dad had a God cell, and I I felt like um, I needed to get rid of some things that didn't mean so much to me anymore, and um, so I got rid of things like dragons and stuff like that. Well, uh, a friend of ours worked with her at the Hyatt Regency. She was a professional cook, and she heard the. Oh, she told me that my mom was in tears. Uh, she felt like uh, she was going to lose me, like I let go of those things in my life. And the thing is, my mom and I didn't have a close relationship. Uh, when I was a baby, I didn't want to be held, so she thought I hated her. And so this was another form of rejection to her. She felt like I was going to let go of her, like I let go of those things in my life. And... Um, so, um, without having the time to go into the, the process that, that she went to, through in coming to know Christ, one of the things was I had to move back home, and I didn't understand it. Uh, when I walked into the house, uh, I, uh, it was dark, and, and I just kept praying. I kept asking God. The whole church kept praying. But um, anyway. Uh, she, she came to know the Lord. Uh, she got saved, and um, and um, one of her friends had had said, asked my mom. She goes, "What is it about Lisa that has that there's that glow upon her face?" And my mom goes, "She became a Christian." And this was the same friend that introduced her to witchcraft, and. Um, so 
Uh, so, so anyway, um, my mom, you know, the Lord got a hold of her life and the Lord got a hold of my life and, and we were changed. And she had, I, I, had, I had prayed before this had happened, Lord, give me that one best friend. And it ended up being my mother. And because she had such a passion for the word, she had such a passion for truth. And, and we prayed together, we were in ministry together, we encouraged each other, and I still didn't want no hugs. Uh, you know, <laughs> but God just did a real work in that. And, and um, in fact, um, God restored her, you know, relationship. Uh, it's not long, but when I was going through things, I came across this note, this card that she sent me. Been thinking about you a lot lately, thinking about what a special daughter you are and what a beautiful person you become. You brought so much joy to our family. You're an important part of so many happy memories. And when you're not around, you're missed very much. Been thinking about you a lot lately and loving you more than ever. I love you so much. You add so much that is wonderful to my real mom. And my mom lived for the Lord to her, for the Lord till her last breath here on earth. And, and there's some verses, there's some of my favorite verses. Um, you are a new creation, the old has passed away the new has come. Behold, you have a new life in Christ Jesus. Yes? And then in Psalms 42, my life verse, and there's another story to that. God gave it to me word for word. Um, um, it, but I'll share part of it. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longeth after you. My soul thirsts for you, the living God. And that's my life verse. And you know, God has the power to change. He, pay, he changed my life. He changed my mother's life. He can change your life. And, and I believe that he died. He's resurrected. He's alive today. He ain't dead. He's still at work. And he ain't finished with what he's doing in my life. And it's not by my own efforts. There's not nothing that I've done to earn this. There's no way. There's nothing that my mom had done, certainly, to earn salvation. It's just surrendering your will, and it's not by my power, not by my strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, not by my, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And, and he, can, he's, he can transform your life like he's transferred mine. It doesn't, mine, it doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter. I want to thank Lisa on several levels. One, just for your willingness to follow the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit to share your testimony. And what an encouragement to us to hear it and to be inspired by it and to see you living this out and being a witness. And then to be reminded that he is in the business of bringing us out of darkness and out of witchcraft and out of broken relationships and creating us into new creation in Jesus Christ and that it is his spirit at work in us. So thank you for sharing that. And on behalf of the church, I do want to pray for you um, at this time, all right? So Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, mighty God, thank you for this witness, this testimony, this proclamation um, that Lisa has shared that it has inspired, encouraged, uplifted us, that she has proclaimed it boldly, that she's reminded us of how you work and that you do work and you work in our individual lives and in our own circumstances and you call us out and we give you thanks for this and we ask that you continue to just make yourself known in mighty ways to Lisa and that you would bless her and watch over her and protect her, her and her household in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Now today's scripture reading is 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. It says we're a holy people. We don't think of it that way. But we're standing on holy ground. We don't think of it that way, but God's everywhere. If you're able to, let's stand and sing holy ground. This is holy ground We're standing on holy ground For the Lord is present And where he is is holy
Chorus one more time, just the voices. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels. David's going to come and lead us in prayer, and you can be seated. And then uh, we'll be taking up our offering after that. Um, David Taylor, is he here? That's who I have. Maybe it's not right. Um, but. I thought I had him on safety team. Oh, okay. Mike's got, he figured it out. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks in all things we are reminded of what the presence and peace of knowing you and having you, how that changes things. We are encouraged by worshiping together, by being in your word together, and giving these praises and prayers. Oh, that we've sensed that you are work in our midst and in our lives. Thank you for those that are gathered here and those that might be viewing this today from home or at another time. Touch each life as we know you can and we know you will. We do give thanks for the sacrificial labor of people on this Labor Day weekend, the hard work that people do to provide for their families and to express their love and their care for their homes by being providers, by working, by being in the labor force. Father, the hat builds people and provides. It's your way of working in our lives. Thank you. Thank you for the laborers. Thank you for the laborers who labor here to serve you and to bring you glory and to meet the needs of people that are around us. Thank you. Thank you for the witness of angels all around. Thank you for the disciples and the believers in our midst today. Thank you. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
just understand what we've just sung about and that on your holy ground it's like the testimony we just heard it's not by our power or might but by your spirit so help us humble ourselves Lord help us surrender to you Lord help us learn from your word now in Jesus name I pray well, once again, good morning. I'm so pleased to be here with each of you. I want to give thanks to the praise team and the tech team for leading us and helping us get into this time of worship today to, together. Um, last week, you may recall that we had uh, completed a series out of the Gospel of John of the seven signs of the seven miracles pointing us to the miracle maker who is the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. And we were in John 11 last week where 
uh, Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And that message was titled, Liberating Love, that Jesus came and liberated Lazarus from death and resurrected him. And, and in that, Jesus is signaling he is the liberator for you and for me to liberate us from death and from the grave, and to have everlasting life and resurrected bodies. And, and so that was the message of Christ's liberate, liberating love. And that whole series was trusting God with your impossible. All of those were to point us to Jesus. Today we're in Exodus, and we're going to start a series in Exodus, and the whole point of everything that we're going to look at at Exodus is going to continue to show us the liberating love of Jesus Christ. Everything that we're going to look at in in Exodus is also going to point us, just like the seven signs, the seven miracles of the Gospel of John, everything in Exodus is pointing us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. You know that all of Scripture is pointing us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. So the word exodus is, means exiting, obviously. It means he's going to take us out. He's going to deliver us. He's going to redeem us. But it also means he's taking us out not just to leave us to figure things out on our own and to sort and to sift and to stumble and to struggle and to have no bearing and no direction and no way to go. No, he's a liberator. He's a redeemer. He exits us out of our Egypt and into everlasting life. He takes us, but he doesn't leave us. He delivers us to everlasting life. So we're going to look at this today from that perspective. That Exodus... And this passage are about liberating love. Being called out but called into. Being redeemed by Jesus Christ. He paying the ransom to set his people free. To snatch us back. I mentioned last week a book named Grave Robber, associated with Lazarus being called out of the tomb. Grave Robber is about the evil one has robbed us of God's best life for us. The evil one has robbed us of our Garden of Eden. The evil one has robbed us from righteousness before a holy God. And in that, there is death. And Jesus comes along and he says, Satan, you don't have the final word on this. I'm going to rob that grave of its death. I'm going to leave you saying, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And Jesus Christ ransoms us and redeems us and brings us back. He redeems his own. So let's take a look at the passage today. Exodus chapter 3. Let's read 1 through 6 to begin. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This is uh, our first bullet point for today is that God is close by in our call. He is holy. He is set apart. He is divine. He is righteous. He alone is righteous. But he is approachable. He is approachable when we are reverent. He is approachable when we are repentant. We are, he is approachable when we are redeemed. And this is saying he is holy, but he's near. He's holy, but he's approachable. He's holy, but he calls. He calls us out. I want to give some background. Many of us are familiar with the 340s of Moses' life. You know, he was born of Hebrew parents at a time when he would have been put to death at his birth. So they hit him away and then placed him in the river, and he was taken in and raised in Pharaoh's household in Egypt. The first 40 years of his life, he was raised an Egyptian in the house of Pharaoh. But he was always a Hebrew, and he knew he was a Hebrew. And at the end of that 40 years, he saw one of the Hebrews being oppressed and beaten and brutally abused by an Egyptian. So Moses had a liberation plan that came to him. His plan, not God's plan. And he killed the Egyptian. Well, the way that ended up is that Moses had to leave and flee for his life. Which brings us to the second 40 of the three 40s of Moses' life. This is where we pick up the story. This is where Exodus 3 finds Moses. He's in a wilderness. He's in a desolate place. He's in a desert. He's tending sheep that are not his own. Moses has written in Genesis 46 that to the Egyptians, being a shepherd was the most detestable work that you could do. This is what Moses had learned and grown up with and understood that this is detestable work. And for 40 years, he's been doing it in a desert where it's work to go find green pasture to feed the sheep and fresh water to water the sheep. 40 years of a routine of getting up, Wander in the desert. Look for some green pasture. Look for some fresh water. Tend the sheep. Detestable work. 40 years. It's a personal 40 years of wilderness wandering. His wilderness wandering. I see myself in. And my situation in that, get up, put on the coffee, check the news, read my Bible, or read my Bible, check the news. (laughs) Sin and corruption. All right. Get ready for work. Go to work. Come home. Do the chores. Some of you have a lot of chores after a full day at the work. Fix the dinner, do the laundry, run the vacuum. Next day, get up, make the coffee, read my Bible, check the news, go to work. But there's so much more. So much more, but it had become ex- extremely ordinary to Moses and became extremely familiar to Moses doing this detestable work, this labor of looking every day for more fresh pasture and more fresh water and tending the sheep, the detestable job. 
Remember, Exodus is about being called out from being called into something. That he doesn't just pull us out and abandon us. He calls us out and he delivers us into something so much better. That's where we are today. And when Moses has his call, this is our first bullet point today. God is close by in our call. Yes, he is holy, he is divine, he is set apart, and yet he is still near. Near enough that he can see the burning bush. Near enough that he can hear Moses, Moses coming from the bush. God de declares the place holy. You're standing on holy ground. Only the righteous God is able, only our righteous God is able to declare or make a person holy or declare a place or make a place holy. Only our holy God can do that. And yet he says, Moses, Moses, But there's still some distance for you and for me. That thing that separates us from being as near to God as we can be is sin that separates us from a holy God. So if we look at Revelation 15, we are reminded that God alone is holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. He alone is holy. Now, Exodus is called the gospel of the Old Testament because God is delivering his people just as Christ redeems and delivers us in the New Testament. And it is the redemption story, and it is a ransom story, but it's also a missionary story that all of the nations would see the mighty God and the love of God and the provision of God that he had for his people, the Israelites. And that that would be a witness to all the other nations. And so... You alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. And then, Revelations 4.8. Uh, they are worshiping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. I am holy, verse 5. Do not come near. Remove your sandals. The place is holy ground. Verse 6. I am the God of your father. But this God calls him close. And he's approachable with reverence and in redemption and in ransom. He's approachable and he wants to be with us and he desires to be as near to us as possible. And in this despicable job, this detestable job that Moses has of being a shepherd, we are reminded that this is a shepherd to sheep specific call. The shepherd is saying, Moses, Moses, insert your name, for Moses, Moses, John 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He takes on this identity of a detestable, despicable job. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And then John 10, 27. 
My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. It is a sheep specific call from the shepherd. Moses, Moses. God is close by in his call that is specific to you and to me. He is holy. He is divine. He is righteous. He alone is righteous. He alone names and makes things holy. And he desires to place us in his holiness, to cover us in his holiness, to ransom us and redeem us, to show us his liberating love. Verses seven and through nine. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them. Let us let that soak in. So I have come down to rescue them. I'm reminded of Matthew 123. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a child, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus came from heaven to earth. to redeem us, to become the perfect lamb. Here, God says, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land and into a good and spacious land, land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And so our God sees us in our calamity, which is the second point today. He is concerned for us in our calamity. He has seen the affliction, he has heard the cry, he is aware of the sufferings, he's calmed down, he's rescuing us, he's going to bring us out, but not abandon us. He's going to bring us out and deliver us into a promised land that is abundant, that will provide them with everything they need. There's our gospel story. Jesus coming down to rescue us. To redeem us, to ransom us, to purchase for us everlasting life. A life that begins today as was shared in the testimony we heard today. That he creates in us a new creation. He changes things today. And he delivers us to heaven, to resurrected bodies, to new life. God is concerned for us in our calamity. The cries of the sons of Israel had come to him. He had seen the oppression and he sees our calamity and our sin and in our suffering. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Nahum says, the Lord is good, a refuge in our trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Isaiah 41, 10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God and I will strengthen you. 
And God is close by in our call. He is divine and holy and set apart, but he is approachable and he is near. And he specifically calls us by name. God is concerned for our calamity. He sees and knows our affliction. He has come to rescue us and to deliver us. He is our safe place. He is our refuge. Our third point. God is our companion in our commission. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this will be my, the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose I go, and the Israel, I say to the Israelites, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? then what should I tell them? I don't even know your name. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. A couple of things. I want to fill in some blanks. Remember how we read a little bit ago that Moses sees the bush burning and it's a thorny, thistly bush. bush. In Genesis 3, there's the fall of men. You know, Adam and Eve sin. And so God's best for them was taken. And in Genesis 3, the land becomes cursed. And your labor will increase. And the thorny, thistly bushes are going to be in this desolate, hard, cursed land. Genesis 3. For Moses, seeing a burning bush would have been a part of his ordinary routine, not daily. But to see a bush, a thorny, thistly bush in the desert burn up is an ordinary event. What is extraordinary is that it was not consumed. That is what drew Moses to go take a better look. I want to remind us that from Genesis 3, the land is cursed and that thorny, thistly things are a symbol of our sin that made the land cursed. And now we have a God coming in a flame of a thorny, thistly bush to tell us what he's going to deliver his people from And for you and for me, we understand that he has come to deliver us from the thorny, thistly sin of our lives. And he has come to deliver us from a cursed land to a promised land. This is important. You get it, don't you? You get it. So here in this passage, he says that God is close by. He is concerned for our calamity. He is our companion and our commission. And in our commission... He says in verse 10, I will send you, go. 
And the mission is so that he may bring them out of Egypt. And how can this not remind us of Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Go, therefore, or Acts 1, 8, or sent to make disciples of all nations, all people groups. He's commissioned us. He has sent us. And he is sending Moses. Well, hey. Moses gives excuses, two excuses here in chapter three. He gives three more excuses in chapter four. You know, it's, I don't know your name. What am I to say? In chapter four, it's, please don't send me. I don't have good speech. Okay, please send someone else. Excuses. It's a sheep specific call. He calls you, he calls me. Moses, Moses, I am sending you. It's a sheep specific call to share the good news so that people can be delivered from their Egypt, so that people can be delivered from their thorny, thistly bushes, so that people can be delivered from their cursed land, so that people can be delivered into a promised land, so that people. Ah, can be purified by Christ. But he says to Moses, I will go with you. And he says to them, you will tell them that it is I am who I am. Tell them that that is who has sent you. He sends us, and he goes with us. He is our companion. He says, I will go with you, and this is what you tell him. And so for every excuse that Moses has, God has an answer, and God's answer is, I am with you, and I am sending you, and it is I am who is sending you. You know, the Holy One, the God Almighty, the Holy, 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 the one set apart, the only one that is righteous, the only one who has the power to declare or make something righteous, I am sending you. He has excuses. I have a tendency to say, you know, God, this is how I will serve you if it's in this, within this boundary, this border, within these limitations, if you don't ask me to go to that place or to speak to that person or to do that kind of work, you know, just right here where I'm comfortable and I can make excuses. And God says, but I have an answer for you, Mike. I am who I am and I am sending you and I will be with you. This conjunctive uh, and, God has an answer, reminds me of the very often talked about, but God, illustrations in Scripture. You know, the Apostle Paul says, I planted, and Apollos watered, but God caused the increase. Joseph says to his brothers, you meant this for harm. You meant to harm me, but God meant it for good, to accomplish what he is doing right now, the saving of many lives. Or Paul in Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, life in the promised land. Life delivered from our Egypt, from our desolate place, our desert, our thorny, thistly bushes. So I can make excuses, and God has an answer. So God is close by in our call. He is holy, he is divine, but he is still near, he is approachable. 
God is concerned for our calamity. He hears our cry. He sees our affliction. He knows our suffering. He cares. He comes down. He becomes our refuge, our safe place. We can cast our cares on him. We do not have to fear or be dismayed because he is our God. And he is our companion and our commission to go. Psalm 46, 7. The Lord is almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 1 John 4, 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Oh, and he indwells us today and guides us and he comforts us and he provides for us and he equips us. He is our companion and our commissioning. And it's a sheep specific call from the good shepherd. Then verse 15. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So God is our constant in our creation. He was there in Genesis creating all things and creating mankind and breathing life into us and giving us life. He was there when Adam and Eve sinned and the land became cursed and thorns and thistles were present. He is the God of creation and he makes us new creations through Jesus Christ and gives us new life in Jesus Christ and he gives us everlasting life in Jesus Christ and he gives us resurrected bodies in our heavenly realm. God is constant in our creation. He is the God that keeps his promises. He's, coming, he's, he's, he's saying, hey, look, back there for all those generations to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I was there. And I'm going to keep my promise to Abraham that he'll be the father of many children. Yes. And I am going to be the I am, the holy one, the set apart one, the only righteous one, the almighty God. I am going to be that from generation to generation, from this day to the next day, I am the constant in life. I am the constant in your life. And this is my name forever. Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In Revelation 22.13. I am the Alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the constant in our lives. So here's the sum of it. God is close by in our call. He is holy, he is divine, he is set apart, and still he is near, and still he is approachable, and still he wants to call us over. It's a sheep-specific call, Moses, Moses. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Moses, Moses. God is concerned for us and our calamity. He has seen our affliction. He has heard our cry. He's aware of, he's aware of our sufferings. He knows our thistly, thorny place. He knows the sin in our life. He knows the wilderness wandering that we are in. He knows our desolate place. He knows our Egypt. And he has come down to 
deliver us. God is our companion and our commission. And then he comes down and he gives us a specific commissioning. And he says, go. And we have excuses and he has answers. I am who I am and I send you and I go with you. And then God is our constant in our creation. In our life, when we are in darkness, when we are in sin, and when we are delivered and redeemed, and he names us and calls us and he makes us holy. Instead of uncursed is the land, I am standing on holy ground. He is our constant. He is our alpha. He is our omega. He is our good shepherd. He calls us by name. He comes down to rescue us. He delivers us. He sends us. And he goes with us. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, mighty God, thank you for your mercies, for your grace, for your truth. Thank you for sending the Spirit and indwelling us. Thank you for covering us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ's blood. Our sin debt, sin debt is paid. I've been redeemed. I've been ransomed by the blood of the Lamb. You call us out to call us into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, a land of abundant life and a land of your provision. Oh, you know each one here. You know each one listening. You see our affliction. You come down to rescue us. You call us near you call us by name. You send us out. You go with us. You are the almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this is our time of response. We're going to stand and sing and give praise to God. And we're going to reflect and we're going to remember. And we're going to respond. I don't know what that looks like for you. But I know that if you're here and you have heard the word of God, that it works in us. And for some of us, it's responding to the call for the very first time, maybe. Or some of us, it is confessing a sin that has kept us distant from God instead of near to God. For some of us, it's, I'm in a routine, I'm in a rut, I can't seem to get my spiritual passion. He's calling you out of that. For some of us, he's been calling you into a place of service, a place of ministry, something to do, somewhere to be, someone to help. And you've had excuses. And today is time to take away those excuses and to be set free to follow him and serve him. Let's stand. Let us sing. Let us respond. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. Satan tempts me to despair and 
tells me of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because of sin spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased with his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this love divine. God's perfect Son was sacrificed. To make me righteous in God's eyes This river's death I cannot know But I can glory in its flood The Lord Most High has bowed down low And poured on me His glorious love And poured on me His glory Thank you for worshiping with us today. So much encouragement from us gathering together. So much encouragement when we hear the word of God together and we reflect on it and we respond to it. He is at work. He is calling us into his divine purpose and plan. And he is sending us into his mission field to save a lost and hurting world. He takes us out to bring us in. He delivers us from to give us something better, the best. Go in the peace and the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, God with us. Amen. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory.